Hello, everybody. Jason here from the At The Coalface podcast. I've created a new sub-series called Mentoring Moments, and Mentoring Moments is composed of clips taken from my one-on-one and group mentorship sessions where we discuss e-commerce, digital, retail, and so much more. Hopefully, you get a lot out of this. Enjoy. So I'm with Michael Whiteley here, and we're having our one of our one-to-one mentorship sessions, and he raised something that I think is going to be super broadly valuable to a much wider audience. And he helps to run an agency, a digital agency, and he was just talking about the fact that it can be a ch- very challenging at times when you're running an agency to manage client expectations. And almost regardless of the budget, and I've run into this myself when I've been running agencies, almost regardless of the budget that they come in with, clients will have some default expectations in their mind around the website that they're going to get. They'll have a default expectation around the level of design. They'll have a default expectation around the level of functionality. They'll have a default expectation, perhaps even around the level of system integration that will be included with the project. They'll just come in with some default expectations. And Michael, I think you you raised the very good point that sometimes their expectations don't really align with reality or don't necessarily align with their budget. And so how do we manage budgets or how do we manage expectations or reset expectations in that kind of environment? Would that be a fair assessment of, of, the, of the kind of thing we were talking about there? Yes, that's right. And I think I, that, look, I think, that, no, you go ahead. You go ahead, Michael. I think a lot of clients have an idea of what they want and really as an agency there's a fine line between spending too much time quoting and finding out exactly what the client wants and if you think about it that could take run into two three days worth of work whereas which you can then risk losing the contract so there is a fine line between spending too much time and finding out exactly what the client wants or further down the line of a budget and finding out halfway between it that they're expecting X, X or Y functionality. Yeah, absolutely. No, this is a very common challenge in the digital space. Basically, any agency, whether they're a creative agency, a development agency, whether they're design, analytics, doesn't really matter what you specialize in as a digital agency. Every, every agency struggles with this. <clears throat> but in particular, when you're talking development agencies that do scoping, design, development, and then maybe even systems integration on top. So they do custom implementations, basically, of, of e-commerce websites. <clears throat> Pardon me. This becomes a, a very big challenge. Now, it all starts back with the pretty much when you like a lot of agencies, they don't necessarily have a salesperson that's engaging with the client initially. Some don't. But in any case, whoever it is that engages with a client initially, whether that be a solution architect whether that be a business analyst, whether that be a project manager, whether that be a sales rep, an account manager, it depends. Every agency runs things slightly differently in terms of kind of the first face of the agency. Sometimes it's the agency principal. Sometimes it's the agency owner that they'll speak to first off. If it's a small to medium-sized agency, it's often, in fact, the agency owner or agency principal. And what usually I recommend in these scenarios is that right out of the gate, you establish with the client how you want to engage or how they want to engage with you. Now, there's two primary ways that I would lay this out to them. I would say, would you prefer to engage whereby you tell me and we work together to establish the scope of work and the requirements, and then I tell you what kind of budget would be required to achieve that high-level estimation until we get into detailed discovery and solution design? Or would you prefer to tell me a budget And then I tell you what you can get for that budget. So we can't have it both ways. So if you have a, if you have a really fixed budget in mind, then I would always recommend, Hey, let's work from the budget backwards because during the discovery process, (laughs) then I can guide you down a path to being able to hit that budget. So if you come to me and you say, okay, here's a piece of functionality we want to achieve. I might be able to say to you, we could do 80% of that and get you 80% of the way there on that piece of functionality, but we could do this in a little bit more of an efficient way and still hit your budget, but it won't be 100% of that functionality, and here's the compromise you'd need to make. Or are you coming in with a very set idea of both your strategic priorities and all of the tactical functionality that's required to deliver on that? And if you are, then what the way we have to go about this is we do a full-blown discovery we document all the requirements in detail, and then we can yep. come back to you with either, a, depending on how your agency runs, either a fixed price quote for the implementation or at least a very tight estimate, give or take 10, 20 percent 
for the actual implementation. So I think you have to head these kinds of challenges off at the pass before they ever sign on the dotted line to engage with you. Because once you're in the yep. middle of an engagement, it's very difficult to course correct mid-engagement. Yes, definitely. Would you recommend different agencies or do different things, but the actual discussion in the second option, would you charge for something like that, given that the client could actually take that discovery away to another agency and ask them to develop it? Because as you can probably appreciate, finding out what a client wants is the challenge of it building any sort of e-commerce website. Yeah, the only time you don't charge, the only time you typically don't charge for a discovery should be in an RFP scenario. So obviously the discovery is the RFP document effectively, yeah, and then sure. you're effectively expected to scope based on the RFP and then put together a pretty accurate, if not a fixed price quote, then definitely a pretty accurate estimate based on the documentation that you've received. Whereas outside of RFP scenario, which is request for proposal for those that, that don't necessarily know that term. In a traditional engagement model where they're just feeling you out, they're trying to figure out whether you're a good fit for them personality-wise and, and ability to deliver-wise, technical capabilities, etc., knowledge of the platforms that they're considering, all those sorts of considerations come into the discussion. But assuming that initial pre-discovery, so there's two phases and sometimes they can get a little muddled up. There's the pre-sales or pre-discovery phase, which is that kind of feeling yeah. each other out. Are we a good fit? Can we even do the kind of work that you're expecting us to do? Are we a good personality fit? Do we think you have realistic expectations? Do, does the customer think that you can actually deliver all the things they need you to deliver to keep them happy and make them happy? And do they think that very high level, the types of budgets that you typically work with are a good fit for them? Because obviously, if you traditionally target, say, merchants that are doing $5 million euro a year or more in revenue, and that is your ICP, then if they're doing half a million euro a year in revenue, then out of the gate, automatically, you can disqualify them and say, look, we can't help you because we target this type of merchant for these reasons. But what we can do is we can hopefully point you in the direction of another agency that should be able to help you. And so you can head off a ton of these pain points in the pre-discovery phase, what I consider the pre-qualification phase or the alignment phase before they've ever signed on the dotted line. But once you get the alignment dealt with, you, you decide, yep, we're a good fit for each other or we think we're a good fit for each other. Now we need to go into formal discovery, which as you say, can take anywhere from one to two full days of discovery, up anywhere from eight to sort of 16 hours worth of discovery. At that point, I urge every single agency to start charging right then and there for that first phase. Now, some agencies will do that on a time and materials basis, but what I recommend to help reduce the downside risk for the client on that first paid engagement, fix price that piece. So say, hey, yeah. we're going to fix price the discovery. We're going to give that to you. It's a fixed fee of, I don't know, 2000 bucks or whatever it is. And whether it takes us one yeah. day or five days to, to get to the final discovery and to where we can actually do some solutioning around this, we'll, we'll take that on our own back regardless of how long that takes ultimately. But we can give you some some downside risk pr protection by fixed pricing this. And then once we get yeah. out, and even from day one, even before we do discovery, we can get at least ballpark the estimate for the actual implement, the, the design and the implementation in the, in the development phase. So basically the production phases, but we can't fixed price that, for example, until we've completed the paid discovery. And then we can, yeah. and then we can either, and then we can either hugely refine our estimate of the delivery or we can give you a fixed price quote, depending on what you want. Now, just also some clients will say, some clients will demand that you give them a fixed price quote after discovery, in which case you can say to them, look, we're happy to do that. However, just be aware that we have to build in a fixed price quote scenario, by definition, in order to protect our downside risk, we have to put a little bit of fat, extra fat in there to protect against any kind of scope tweaks that are not necessarily formal change requests, but the scope changes a little bit to what we discussed during discovery. We don't want to nickel and dime you. So we're going to build a little bit of extra fat into that. And, I, and if you're okay with that, then absolutely we can fix price that because there's always some unknowns there. If you'd prefer, what we can do is we can give you a very tight estimate basis, but we can T&M the actual production phase, but it will come out very much, very close to the estimate. And we don't have to be, we don't have to build as much fat into the estimate as we would with a fixed price because you're paying for time and materials. And if the scope changes, just, that's fine. You'll we'll agree that the scope is changing mid development, and we can just add that to the add that to the scope of work. Sounds great. So, look, I think that's such a great question that you've asked because it is such a major thing that, especially young agencies or smaller agencies that haven't necessarily dealt 
with larger, more complex clients that come in with super high expectations, or they basically dictate to you how you will engage with them versus the other way around. But what I have found is that if you are very confident in the way that you will engage and you say, look, this is how we engage, this is our process, because if we don't follow this process, we know that we don't get the kind of outcomes that we expect of ourselves. And so for us to be able to deliver at the level we expect of us, then we have to engage in this way to minimize the risk and unknowns for us, but more importantly for you, Mr. Mrs. Client. So I think if you can set those expectations, basically early and often is the key catchphrase here. Set expectations early and often, be super transparent at every step and every milestone, be super clear about your expectations of them and what they're going to have to bring to the table in terms of dependencies during the implementation or during the production phase that we have as agencies, we have massive dependencies on the client to deliver our work. So we've got content, we've got imagery, we've got different tax configurations, and we've got all, we've got a hundred different things at sure we can uncover most of these items during discovery, but there are always things that come up mid project where there's a dependency on the merchant to deliver certain things to us for us to do our work. And we just have to build those into the project timeline and outline those dependencies as clearly as possible so that they know the timeline is not all on us because there's not only is there the merchant to think about, but there's often other third parties. There's ERP vendors, there's PIM vendors, there's CDP vendors, there's all sorts of other app vendors and they have to provision systems and SaaS platforms and everything else. So there are always dependencies in these projects. And so I think being very transparent about the dependencies from day one also can help set expectations around timeline even more so than budget. Yeah, I totally take on board your point around the client dependencies or the client knowing early as possible what their role within this project is. I think a lot of the time agencies may tell clients at the end of the build that it's their turn now to populate it when in turn, when really that doesn't need to happen at that stage. While the development is being taken place, they can do their product import, image import. They actually don't need the actual front end to be built by that time. So if you can run parallel alongside uh, uh, alongside your client, the delivery is much smoother. Com- completely agree. And just it helps to make use of that. Any parallel operations you can do, even to the point of, hey, and the category page signed off from a design perspective, for example, we're not going to wait for you to design sign off on the PDP, the cart, the checkout, the the, the header, the footer, the mega menu. We're not going to we're not necessarily even going to make you sign off on the information architecture from day one. We can start on the pages or the elements and the components of the design you've signed off on so that we can actually get that into the production phase as quickly as possible. Sometimes yeah. that that can work against you take too much pressure off the client to make sure we can get through the design phase efficiently and completely. But I found that where the design phase starts to drag and it starts to screw with your production schedule, because oftentimes you'll have resources carved out for development. And if you can't get it into yeah. development, then they're sitting there you know, with their thumb up their backside and you're paying them to sit there with no work. Then sometimes to ease a project along, you can say, look, we wouldn't normally do this, but you've already signed off on the homepage. You've already signed on the, off on the category page. Let us get that into build. It's going to take us a bit of time to put the logic all together for that and all the widgets and the, or in the case of Shopify, the sections and all that sort of stuff. It's going to take us a while to customize the theme on that front and apply general styles and all that stuff. So let us get that into development whilst we're finishing off the last few components of the design, the full design to get it into production. And you can also, one of those deliverables that I was talking about in terms of being clear with the client, what deliverables that you're going to provide at each stage of the process, that includes discovery. So oftentimes, clients will not come in with a BRD. They won't come with a business requirements document. So what I engage with the client before, so most of my services, for example, are pre-agency. So I'll work with the client to, to do all the discovery with them. I'll help them define their requirements because oftentimes they have no idea where to even begin to define requirements. I'll draft and document the BRD in a way that agencies can understand and provide a reasonable against. But many merchants, they don't have a me or they don't hire a consultant. And so they come directly to the agency fresh and green. So they don't have have a BRD business requirements document to hand over to you. So what in those scenarios, what I would do is I would say, not only are we going to document the discovery, which is usually like in a spreadsheet question and answer format, but the output of the discovery is going to be a fully documented business requirements document, right? We're going to take the require yeah. the individual requirements, 
out of the spreadsheet and we're going to craft that into all of the major sections of the website where they belong and all the functional requirements, the customizations, any integrations, any apps, et cetera. We're going to document those very clearly in a business requirements document, which effectively becomes the scope of work that they're signing off on. And yeah. then you present that back to them and you actually walk them through it, spend an hour walking through that BR page by page. Yeah. But what I do is I always give my clients the BRD, the draft BRD, when it's about 90% complete, because then at that point yeah. they can start, I, I just do a get, shared Google Doc. They can put their comments directly in the Google areas that they want to have tweaked slightly, or they want to make some comments, or they want to expand the scope in a specific area. They can just put their comments in there. Yeah. I'll expand the document. I'll make sure it's all covered. And then once they sign off on that BRD, then it's ready to go the, to the agency. Or in your case, if you're creating the BRD, then it's ready to basically for you to create both your designs as well as your full-blown solution specification off of or functional yeah. funk spec or whatever your next level of documentation is usually it usually typically it would go from brd to a combination of designs and like a funk spec combined together so that it's really clear what you're actually delivering yeah yeah so definitely i would definitely recommend to any any retailers out there to actually take that process of either hiring an external consultant or actually spending the time with the agency that you're working with to, to really thrash out your ideas, such a critical part of a project. And I think it's often overlooked because of budget, but it's really, it's laying the foundations for a, for a successful project. It's always cheaper, faster, and easier to measure three times and cut once than it is to have to go and buy another board. That's just, that's the reality of it. Yeah, 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 definitely. So anything else that's been on your mind over the last, I know, look, I know you're on holiday and I don't want to interrupt your, interrupt your holiday for too long here, but is there been anything else that you've encountered over the last couple of weeks that you think, hey, I'd love to talk chat about this? No, not at the moment. That's been, a, that's been the one, I'm sure like many agencies, that's, that's the second point that we have to deal with at the moment. I also sometimes would like to be able to say to a client that it's good to join us on the retainer to be able to fill out any gaps that are not within the budget. But unfortunately, with the recession and or possible recession that we're entering, clients are less likely to be to be joining as a retainer at the moment. That's what we're trying, what we're finding at the moment. Yeah, look, it's one of those things where it's always hard to pre-sell a retainer when you're also asking for a massive cap it, capex spend right up front plus they're staring down the barrel barrel of opex spend in the form of platform licensing or subscription in the case of SaaS platforms plus all the apps and plugins and ancillary systems so look i totally understand but i think more than anything else it's really important to start creating during the discovery process if they haven't come to you with a brd in particular this is critical so whether you use the moscow method during discovery or whether you create the must-haves, the nice-to-haves, and the wish list items, unless you, right from day one, when you're starting to go through the discovery, if you're not looking through that must-have, nice-to-have, wish list type of lens, then it makes it difficult yeah. to be transparent with the customer around the types of work that you would typically do or accomplish under a retainer. Whereas, basically, if the MVP, the quote-unquote MVP, out of discovery is because of budget, or because of literally the MVP requirements, the minimum viable product requirements are the must-haves. And now we've still got 26 nice-to-haves and we've got 15 wish list items. Then those yeah. 26 plus 15, those become the first cabs off the rank for your retainer engagement, right? And so yeah. I think you yeah. can start, even if you don't flat out say, hey, we offer a post-live retainer model for managed services and we can budget from say 20 hours to 40 hours a month and we'll give you an account manager. You don't even have to say those things up front, but you very clearly delineate the must-haves, nice-to-haves, and wish lists during the discovery process and just keep those on a separate sheet, then you can go back to those yes. at the end and you can say, hey, these are perfect candidates for a retainer engagement because we know we can't yes. deliver them as part of the MVP because of either timeline, yes. budget constraints, or both, but this is the exact kind of thing that we would roadmap out as part of our account management service. Yes, definitely. Awesome, man. Listen, you have a fabulous rest of your holiday. Have a nice break. You deserve it. We all deserve a holiday after bloody COVID sl slowly coming to an end here. So <laughs> I think we all deserve a, a pretty nice break. So you go. You have a fantastic break. Awesome chatting with you. And I look forward to catching up again in a couple of weeks. 
So I'm with Ashley, and we're doing a bit of one-on-one mentorship at the moment. And she asked a very good question that I think will be super relevant to a lots of other people. And that is that she sometimes has clients that expect a low ACK, so very low customer acquisition cost, primarily through performance marketing. It's typically when you're talking about CAC and want really high revenue returns or really high ROI for that very low CAC. And how do you face that? How do you have that discussion? How do you reset expectations? How do we try to get leadership, quote unquote leadership, to a better place of understanding and appreciating the challenges of trying to reduce CAC and increase ROI at the same time, or at least in, increase acquisition rates, right? Usually what they mean is increase conversion rates, right? So by definition, when you are doing performance marketing, that is extremely bottom of the funnel acquisition. So you're, what you're really doing is in that environment, you are capturing demand. You are not creating demand, you are capturing demand. And so by definition, you are at the mercy of the platforms that you're doing the performance marketing on. So that's typically your Facebooks, your Googles, your Critio networks, et cetera. So whether you're doing remarketing or whether you're doing initial marketing, either way, you are at the mercy of the networks that you're doing the performance marketing through. And by definition, those are all bottom of the funnel acquisition models. And what that means is that instead of going out and creating a category on behalf of the brand that you're working for, you or not necessarily creating a category because sometimes that category may already exist, but you're creating brand, you're trying to create brand equity in the market. You're trying to educate, you're trying to teach, you're trying to create brand affinity. You are trying to, to go out there and actually create demand instead of just capture it. So when we talk about performance marketing, when we talk about CAC, Oftentimes, that's through the lens of a conversion or conversion expectation that is expected to happen within 10, 20, 30, 60 days. Usually, the attribution window for performance marketing is 30 days. And as a result of that, the expectation is that the conversion will happen within 30 days of seeing one of those ads or clicking on one of those ads or remarketing against someone who's seen one of those ads or interacted with an ad. And the challenge with this model is, again, that you are completely at the mercy of the platforms that are open marketplaces for bidding on placements for these ads or impressions for these ads. And as a result of that, you are not completely or entirely in control of CAC in this environment, right? You are at the mercy of the platform. You're at the mercy of the competition in the marketplace for those keywords, for those triggers, for that demographic, for that cohort. And as a result of that, if they if leadership hands down some sort of arbitrary number for CAC, so they say, hey, we want our customer acquisition costs to be X, but if the competition is Y and they haven't take taken a data-informed decision on what CAC should be based on the competitive landscape in the marketplace, then this is an opportunity for you to educate them because we can do that research. We can do the research on demand for Google ads. We can do research on demand for Facebook ads within a specific cohort or keyword or target demographic. And the only other way that you can reasonably contain CAC, you won't necessarily be able to reduce it, but what you will be able to do is to is to have absolutely amazing zero and first party data. Now, why does that matter? So So when you do not have fantastic zero and first party data in your own CDP platform or in your own marketing automation platform, you are 100% at the mercy of the Googles and the Facebooks of the world from a targeting perspective, right? Whereas if you have really high quality zero and first party data and you are creating the cohorts, you are creating the segments, the, the target segments in your own CDP, and then you are sending those segments off to the Googles and the Facebooks to create your lookalike audiences from that you then market to, then obviously you are not completely at their mercy, their targeting mercy. You are saying you are giving them a cohort and you are saying, find me more people like this. And and so instead of just let, let me trust them because that's really what Google and Facebook want you to do. They because they have massive amounts of zero and first party data. They want you to just trust them. They want you to say, okay, you tell us who you want us to target. The demographic, target the gender, target the 
target their income level, target their locale, target all these different things, maybe even job titles, et cetera, then we'll go out there and we'll find them. But that requires a tremendous amount of trust on your part that they're going to do the right thing and they're going to work in your best interest to reduce your CAC when in actuality they want to maximize their revenue. So they're going to all, there's always this tension between hyper accurate targeting that's going to get great results for you, but is going to get maximum revenue for them. There's always this tension there. So the only way to break the tension is to dictate to them, hey, here's the audience I'm going after. Go and find me more people like this. And the great thing about that is that their algorithm, you won't necessarily know how they're able to connect the dots together to find a cohort similar to what you've sent them, but they do. And that's, it, it's because they're machine learning and they're AI. This is not a human being going, let's go find more people like this. This is AI that's going out there and it's looking across their entire data set and saying, okay, who, because they know data on the vast majority of the data set you send them. They, they know the email addresses. They know the people. They know who 95% of those people are. They've got accounts in those platforms. And Facebook and Google have single sign-on technology that is used all across the internet. They have a better, part, a better first-party data set than almost anyone in the world, which is why they have created these walled gardens around their ad networks because they can. And so they charge you for the privilege of accessing their first party data. So the only way to contain CAC, because there's a certain amount of ad inflation every year, Facebook is saying their ad inflation is running at about 30% per year, depending on the cohort you're targeting. Again, Google is running at anywhere from 10 to 30% a year in ad inflation, depending on the cohort you're targeting, depending on the keywords you're targeting. So CAC is always going to rise. And it is, for many brands, it is already unsustainable as a pure, as their sole acquisition channel. And it is going to only get worse from, a, from an acquisition channel perspective. It is those costs are going to continue to rise as online competition increases. And so the only way to start weaning yourself slowly off of that hamster wheel, what I call the hamster wheel of performance media acquisition. Because when we think about this performance media acquisition model, it's really digital sales. If you have an expectation that someone is going to convert off an ad within 30 days of seeing it, you are doing digital transactional marketing. You are not doing, there's no other thing to call it. It is transactional marketing. It's, in fact, I don't even call it marketing because it's not demand generation. It is demand capture. So it's not tr marketing in the truest sense of the word. It is, it is digital sales, right? You are putting an ad in front of someone that you think is, wants to buy your thing now or very soon. The only way to get off that hamster wheel over the medium to long term is, as I said, to, to create fantastic zero and first party data cohorts that you can then remarket to in a very effective way. And you can also treat them in a way that they deserve to be treated and want to be treated as customers and appreciated and respected as customers. But it also allows you to spend time on true demand generation. So you need to be out in the market generating demand for your services, for your products. And that usually involves some combination of being inside of active online groups. So whether that be a Facebook group, whether that be a whether that be Reddit group, whether that be because if you're working in very popular categories, whether it be pets, whether it be computers, whether it be digital marketing, it doesn't really matter what vertical or category your business operates in. There are online communities that already exist around what you do. And so it's about how can we get into these communities because we're part of these communities. How can we offer value? How can we educate? How can we entertain? How can we help? How can we do things that keep us top of mind and actually build demand for our brand and for our services independent of just capturing the existing latent demand that is in the marketplace? How can we generate demand? And so when we think about and to translate this into hopefully something relevant, when I think about what I do, so I put out content every day on LinkedIn, I put out a podcast, I do mentoring, I don't charge for any of that. But what it does do is it starts to establish some credibility for me. It starts to establish some trust. It gives me an opportunity to be in front of people every single day who may at some point in the future need and want some of my services. So I'm not expecting that my content is going to convert into revenue in the next 30 days. That's not the model that, that I work to. In fact, my content is designed, A, to educate me first, to force me to stay current, to force 
me to stay relevant in my own industry, to make sure that I am keeping up with the trends that are happening in my industry, to make sure that I don't become outdated in my knowledge and my capability. So it's my content is first for me. My content is second for my audience, and hopefully it's entertaining, it's engaging, it's fun. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help them to learn things that will benefit them. And then a distant third, and I've said this many times before, distant third, there may be some business that comes out of it. But usually what comes out of it is learning. That's all the primary goals. And then, sure, I don't do any paid advertising for my business because I don't need to, because I have earned the opportunity to have my content in front of my audience on a daily basis. And then if at some point in the future, they need some of the services, services that I offer on top of mine because I'm in their face every single day with my content. And so I think this is the model that most businesses that are sustainable from an acquisition perspective are going to have to move to. They're going to have to move into creating communities. They're going to have to move into creating entertaining, fun, engaging, educational content that keeps you top of mind so that when people are in the market for what you offer, you are the only one that they think of. So for some of my customers that have come to me, say, for example, via LinkedIn messaging, I am literally the only person that is in their feed day in, day out, every single moment, pretty much every single time they open up LinkedIn, I am there. And so when they think of something that they need that I offer, I'm literally the only name that they can think of off the top of their head that they would come to. Now, that's been built out over four years, four plus years, four, five, six years of putting out content almost every single day to get to that status. So when I started producing content in the beginning, I didn't even have a business yet. I was, I was working for brands at that point. I was working brand side. So I didn't start creating content because I had a business. I was trying to keep my pipeline full worth of work. I did it because I wanted to educate myself first. That was always my primary goal. So I think, and this is a long-winded way to say that I think if you get an edict from a manager, a boss, a board, a CEO that says, hey, I expect you to bring down our CAC and I expect you to increase our revenue at the same time. First of all, is that edict and the dictates of the CAC that they're setting for you, is that grounded in reality? Is it grounded in data? Is it grounded in any kind of data-informed thinking? What weight do they give to brand building in the market? What weight do they give to demand generation in the market? And what weight do they give to zero and first-party data collection? And what weight do they give to the technology required to make that happen? And if they haven't done all of those things first, then I think it's going to be a real challenge to meet dictates that are kind of what feel like or can feel like we've pulled these numbers out of thin air based on a budget that we don't even know how they've arrived at this budget. They've just, maybe they've taken, because oftentimes the way budgeting works in these businesses, particularly from a revenue perspective, is they'll take their last year's number, they'll add 10% to it for some random reason, and then they'll say, that's our new number for the new year. So there isn't necessarily a whole lot of data-informed decision-making in a lot of these businesses. So I would always take these opportunities when someone just tells me, oh, I want to bring down my CAC and I want to increase my revenue. That's great. But is this a data-informed, has this been a data-informed process to for you to arrive at these numbers? Or is this just because that's how much money you have to spend or that's how much money you've a allocated to customer acquisition? That's my initial thoughts. I know that was a long-winded way to get to an answer, but hopefully that's useful. No, definitely. That was great. It gave me a few questions to pose to the CMO and possibly she can pose that to the leaders of our acquired company. So yeah, a lot to think about, but it's good to know that I'm not completely off base because I was like, these are two, you can't like increase revenue. It's very difficult to increase revenue while deal decreasing customer acquisition costs. So it's good to know I'm not completely crazy. And what I have been pushing for from the first party data side, I'm a lifecycle marketer. I'm adamant about having clean data and up-to-date data. But on top of that, I've been pushing for those value added pieces of content and getting a content team or someone on the marketing team that can help us create that content that adds value that that we can be the authority in our industry. So we can continuously put out content that, that people are eventually searching for. And then like you said, when they do eventually have a problem or a challenge, we're the first person that, that they think of. But at this point in time, we don't even have the re human resources to be able to build that content. So we have some challenges ahead, but 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think oftentimes brands are internally they're at war with themselves, right? They are at war between the concept of digital sales versus digital marketing. And oftentimes the edict comes down from on high that we need to hit these random numbers. And again, oftentimes we don't even know how they arrived at these numbers. But more importantly, if the marketing team is focused on building sustainable brand demand or sustainable product demand within the umbrella of your brand or sustainable category demand within the umbrella of your brand and your product. Um, mm -hmm. If you are trying to do all of those things, meaning that the marketing team actually understands the concept and understands the strategy and tactics behind true mm -hmm. demand generation, if they really are, if they really get it, but the leadership that sits above marketing doesn't get it, then that is always going to be an uphill battle. It is always yeah. going to be a hard slog because you are always going to have leadership that is is able to override what the marketing team is saying we need to do to, to create sustainable demand outside of the performance marketing paradigm. And so really the first thing to do is to say, okay, who's running this thing? Is the marketing team who has the right ideas around sustainable brand to brand and category demand generation are they always going to be overridden by a senior leadership team that doesn't get it? In which case, it's probably time for those marketers to move on to a, a different business that does get it. Because sometimes if it ends up getting to a place where there is a tug of war between the C-suite, for example, and the marketing department, and the C-suite's always going to win, meaning the CEO, if they don't get marketing, for example, then no matter how good your marketing team is or no matter how good your CMO is, you're always going to be, frankly, pushing shit uphill if the senior leadership above the marketing team doesn't get it. And it's time to, for those people to look at alternative employment options because it's like the age old adage, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You can present them all the data. You can present them your plans. You can present them all the things that you're looking to do. But I think, I think what you can also do is open a dialogue around okay, how are we acquiring customers today? What, is, what are our major acquisition models? What do those look like? What are our acquisition channels today? Because very few businesses rely 100% on performance marketing. They usually have two, three, maybe four major, what they call demand generation, but what I call demand capture channels. And so it might be, it might be going to conferences, it might be going to industry events, it might be, th th there's many different things that businesses do today to acquire customers that oftentimes, if you actually unpick the quote unquote demand that they think they're generating from these channels, and if you look at the actual conversion rate in the pipeline from those channels to converted customers, they convert at low, uh, low levels because those channels that they're executing through are low intent channels. And so if you look at the, and you just have to ask the question, is what we're doing today working or isn't it working? If it's working, fantastic. Let's put more money and more energy behind that. If it isn't working, then let's reallocate that budget to something that we are very confident in the medium to long term absolutely will work. But you have to buy yourself some time to get to the place where you're actually generating de demand consistently. Now, that can happen pretty quick. It can happen usually within, say, six months, but you need the six months to get you there. And the team to be able to help you get there. Yeah, absolutely. And particularly if you have subject matter experts within the business, this is another thing that, that a lot of businesses don't understand, is if the subject matter experts in the business are not willing to get involved in the content creation and community engagement process, if they're not prepared to do that, and then if they think my time's too valuable to be putting out content or sit down in front of a camera or jump onto a a podcast and be a guest on a podcast, or my time is too valuable to do mentorship, or my time is too valuable to do any one of a hundred different true demand generation activities, mm -hmm. then I would question, I, again, I would question how they've arrived at that thinking that their time is too valuable. Because a marketing team that is not that are not subject matter experts, they're going, it's very inauthentic, or it can be, it can come across as very inauthentic for a marketing team who are not subject matter experts necessarily on all the things that their business does, it's going to be very inauthentic if they're trying to push out messages, if they're trying to engage or with or build a community, et cetera. It will come across much like their marketers because they are. And so oftentimes it's a case of the marketing team identifying the highest ROI areas 
for the subject matter experts in the business to engage. So I, it's not for the subject matter expert to go out there and figure out what the go-to-market model is. That's the marketing team's job. But if the subject matter experts won't participate in all the areas that marketing has identified as potentially really good community building areas, demand building areas, then you're fighting with one hand tied behind your back. So you have to have subject matter experts in the business that are willing to engage in all the ways that marketing believe are going to bring the best ROI to the business. For sure. It's interesting you talk about the different channels that that people can acquire leads and and how you have like high performing ones for your particular business and then obviously other channels and it's interesting the situation i'm in right now with my marketing team and the leadership is they're always looking for the quick return right it's always the revenue it's always the money grab that they're after and so they're going after the fad channels right not saying these can't be good when you have a great strategy and and you're consistent, but like they're going after influencers that are super expensive or affiliates or just podcast ads or Amazon ads. Like they're looking for quick, like that quick money grab instead of the channels that really do well. And we can convert very quickly, like with webinars or mm -hmm. when we put out good content and we have it gated, like those mm -hmm. are the two areas that convert quickest. and they have the highest ROI for us, but there's a lot of work that goes into those two channels or those two strategies. And so it's just, it's just interesting. Like we, the team that I'm on has been saying, we need to do more of this. And yet resources keep getting put to quick money grab, like channels and tactics. So there's some sort of disconnect that's going on. <laughs> Yeah, it's a hard discussion. And I, in my own business, I have an absolute mantra. I don't try to sell the unsellable. So if I, if my customers or potential customers or prospects, whatever you want to call them, if they come and talk to me and that they are effectively looking for me to convince them as to why they should work with me, then we're not, we're automatically that disqualifies them because they're not a good fit. So I think, and sometimes internal teams need to take this exact same stance with senior leadership. If senior leadership need to be convinced that something, you know, there's always a certain amount of internal selling that goes on. That's normal. Right. But when you have to start dragging people, kicking and screaming towards a strategy that you know will be effective versus strategies internally that have proven already to not be effective or to be hyper expensive and low ROI activities, if you have to, if you have, if it feels like getting blood from a stone, it's probably time to move on for those marketers. And look, that's an extremely, I guess, blunt thing to say, but it's just, we all have one life. It's pretty short. Do you want to spend, do you want to spend your entire life banging your head against a wall or do you want to move to a brand that gets it? That's the key. And so when I, in the, this is holds true right throughout my whole career whether it's been working for brands, whether it's been running agencies, whether it's been running my own consultancy, and even when I had my own pure play online business, many years ago, pure play e-commerce business, I, at every instance where I've felt like I've had to, where I've felt like I've been pushing shit uphill, I actually have been. I have been genuinely pushing shit uphill. And so I've just, I've learned that I've learned to stop doing that because it's a waste of energy. It's a waste of time. It leads to frustration. And it's like the, uh, again, another adage, you ask a, a fish to climb a tree, you're going to end up frustrated and the fish is going to end up out of water. So it's one of those things that, that I think many brands could learn a valuable lesson, but more importantly, the people working for those brands can learn a lesson, which is if the senior management, which is Unfortunately, what we see, at least down in A and Z today, is still boards that are older. They're, the senior leadership of many of these, especially the largest companies, they're older generation, right? They just, they're not digital natives. They struggle to use a smartphone. So how can they, how is it that they think if they can, if they struggle to use a smartphone, how is it that they think they can dictate to a marketing team what modern marketing looks like? They can't. No, you're completely right. I guess another question, or I just want to get your feedback on one. You had said, I don't try to sell the unsellable. And I love that phrase. So my theory in terms of the marketing funnel or the sales funnel has always been like, start really niche and try to get those people and then go broader because as the broader you go, the more difficult and it's going to be to sell to those people, to educate those people and to actually get them to convert. 
what is maybe my thought process is completely wrong, but what is your thought process in terms of like targeting for that funnel? Are you more of a start with your niche and go broad or do you start broad and then come in? What's interesting is that even sometimes when you are broader, people can enter the funnel at the broadest point and they don't realize that they're being funneled. What I mean by that is that sometimes my content that might seem a little bit broader, meaning it's not hyper-targeted on the three or four pillars that I tend to focus on, which is B2B e-commerce, D2C e-commerce. I tend to focus on two or two, three, four really key content pillars that I focus on really consistently. Like my messaging is really consistent around that, but I mix that up with other content. So for example, in my podcast, I interview SaaS leaders, uh, SaaS technology leaders in e-commerce technology, retail tech, omni-channel tech. And so that is that content isn't doesn't fit necessarily directly underneath one of those two, three, four content pillars around the content that I typically put out, say, on LinkedIn or I put out on TikTok. And then what can happen is that someone that may listen to one of those podcasts, they may go, wow, this was so amazing. I've started to use a piece of technology that I didn't even know existed, for example. And the reason that I came to know about that technology was because of Jason's podcast. Cool. Now that I know what Jason does because I was led to his profile through his content, then at some point in the future, they might go, okay, now I need something that Jason offers as a service. So I think we can get so caught up in making the funnel so narrow in our content that we disqualify people that may need our services at some point in the future. And so they may not know right now, or they may not be in a job or in a position or in a, in a role that that is, even would have an opportunity to work with you. But let's say they change jobs. They, people change jobs all the time. They might change jobs in six months time, and I might be top of mind because of all the other content that's top of the funnel, meaning they're not ready to be in my niche. They're not even, they don't even have the potential to be a customer yet. But in six months time, they instantly go from being not a target customer that I would be trying to sell the unsellable if I tried to sell them today to someone who's a perfect fit for the type of services that I offer. So there is a danger in saying, okay, anybody that our content has to be so hyper-targeted to our niche target market that we exclude everyone who might potentially be a customer in the future. And I think there is a risk in that too. So I think that we have to balance, right, bottom of the funnel type stuff where people are the perfect target cohort and people that may be ready to buy now or soon, very soon. I'm actually trying to create demand sustainable demand in the medium to long term. And by definition, that means my content is going to hit people that are either not even anywhere near my funnel or at the very tippy top of my funnel. That makes sense. Do you have like rough percentages? Because obviously you're going to have top of funnel content, middle of funnel content, and then bottom of funnel content. Do you have like rough percentages of this, this percent of the content that I create is going to be top of funnel, middle funnel, bottom of funnel? Like I don't personally, but that's because I get marketing. A lot of businesses don't. And so they they require a marketing team to to have really clear definitions. What are you doing at these different striations in the funnel or different on the path to purchase? What are you doing throughout the path to purchase from awareness to interest to as they proceed through that journey of and businesses do it in different ways. And they even call different parts of the funnel different things because they think they're such a special business or brand that they need to have a custom funnel. But really, it's just about, it really comes down to awareness, interest, contact, and then the opportunity to actually even sell someone and then conversion. And indeed, it's it's a little bit different because really you're trying to get someone to land on a website and make a purchase through a website. Typically is the D2C approach or maybe physical stores, but oftentimes D2C is just through a pure play website. So what we've seen is that brands that rely on constant acquisition for survival, and we're talking some of the biggest D2C brands in the world, they have never been profitable and they will most likely never be profitable. We look at brands like Allbirds. We look at brands like Casper. We look at so many D2C brands out there, D2C product brands now, and mm-hmm. they have never been profitable and they show no hope of ever being profitable because they have relied on very expensive performance marketing-based acquisition for their customers. And particularly when we're looking at brands like Casper, where the lifecycle marketing 
option with them is so infrequent. Like the like you buy a mattress once every decade if you're lucky, and so it's definitely not it's not a CPG brand. You know, at least with shoes, they are consumable that you wear out reasonably frequently, and even Allbirds can't seem to figure out how to make a profit. So, I just I think that many brands they haven't actually figured out how to create a sustainable pipeline of customers and potential customers because it's got to be a constantly working pipeline constantly working it's you've got to have content out there and you have to constantly be in, co- in potential customers faces so that when they get into a stage where they're ready to consider a service or a product like yours you are top of mind and I, like there's no magic to this and i think a lot of brands expect magic from their marketing yeah. teams they think there's some voodoo that marketing teams can do to go out and find a whole bunch of new customers. There's no voodoo to this, right? There's no magic involved here. It's it's consumer psychology has remained pretty consistent over the last thousand years and reciprocity and all these biological factors that are natural to us as humans, as part of our biology and our psychology, these things are all pretty much the same. It's the way in which we leverage that psychology that's changed and the channels that we tap into that psychology that's changed. But the basic tenets of demand generation haven't really changed much in, in human history. For sure. Yeah, I think the problem is it was so easy five, 10 years, five years ago to just pay to acquire customers. It was cheap and easy. And now that's not the case. I'm working for a startup that just got bought out. And so that was the strategy they used for a really long time. And now it's not working and they don't know what to do, but they're not willing. It seems like they're not willing to change the strategy, change the thought process. And so we're basically burning cash (laughs) right now, which is not great, but. Yeah. It's, I tell you, the, these brands, the, there, a lot of brands have been forced into either pivoting or shutting down. And we have seen a tremendous number of brands that sprang up during COVID and they were side hustles maybe of individuals that lost their jobs or were laid off or were on leave or were working from home. And so they needed a side hustle of some variety. We saw hundreds and hundreds of pure play e-commerce brands spring up during COVID and a tremendous number of those. And they leveraged performance marketing to get their brands off the ground and to capture demand because there was a lot of demand. There was a lot of online demand generated during COVID because people were stuck at home and they had lots of money to spend. They weren't taking holidays or anything else. So they spent buying stuff online. But all of a sudden when reality hit, when COVID let off and people started going back to stores and we went back to the mean, the average mean over the last 10 years of the trajectory of of e-commerce growth as a percentage of retail, that many of those, a huge percentage of those same brands have closed, shut up shop because the, because their acquisition model just was not sustainable. And so businesses either have to get religion or there's going to be massive consolidation, one of the two. And we're already seeing the mass consolidation phase happening right now. If you'd like to register for free for the mentor sessions with Jason Greenwood, head over to greenwoodconsulting.net, scroll all the way to the bottom of the page and click get mentored by Jason. See you there.